One year ago, the situation with Ebola was completely different. The UN Security Council had just taken the extraordinary uh, step to launch the United Nations mission, uh, emergency mission for Ebola. And at that time, there were hundreds of cases of Ebola every single week. And the world was uh, terrified, quite frankly, as to whether or not what was an exponential growth in the number of cases could actually be reversed. Whether these horrific pictures we were seeing in television, in our newspapers, of dead people on the streets of capital cities in West Africa could be reversed. So one month ago, we had just launched what we called the 70-70-60 target. It was an extraordinary goal to try and achieve within just 60 days, 70% uh, case isolation and treatment, 70% safe barrier for the Ebola cases. It was an extraordinary stretch target. And just one year ago, we were right in the midst of getting that operation up and on its feet with a huge stretch target to hit that 70-70-60 goal. The situation today is completely different than one year ago. The most extraordinary thing that's happened is that that 70-70-60 target was hit. By the 1st of December last year, the curve was starting to bend because 70% of cases were being isolated, 77% of people who died from Ebola were being safely buried. And as a result, there was new international confidence and national confidence that we could actually conquer this and, and succeed in stopping the Ebola crisis. So in most ways, today is very, very different than last year in terms of this outbreak, but it's also, though, very, very different than other Ebola outbreaks. Because with most Ebola outbreaks, once that curve, once you pass the peak of the epidemic, you hit zero very quickly. You get down to zero, you reverse the thing, it stops. What's happened here is we've had a very, very long tail. And that's because this is not just an Ebola outbreak. This is an Ebola outbreak with all the baggage of a humanitarian um, international crisis. And that crisis um, in these countries was accompanied by a huge amount of mistrust, by a huge number of real rumors, huge community anxiety, huge problems of community ownership and engagement in this response. And as a result, where it would normally go to zero, we saw a very long tail. So one year later, we're dealing with a still the tail of this outbreak. Very different situation, but getting from here to zero is still a real challenge that's going to require more of the adaptation of the response, more to the local culture and context, more innovation to the reality of the scale of this outbreak than we've seen even so far. Three things made the big difference in the Ebola response. The first thing was leadership, extraordinary leadership at a national level. The, nation, the presidents of these countries led the response. They put their A-teams on the response. They set up emergency operation centers led by their top people who knew their country and knew how to use the machinery of government to get this thing to zero. That was accompanied by strong leadership from the UN side, from the NGO side, and from so many other partners, both multinational agencies as well as some national agencies. Extraordinary leadership, extraordinary individuals in those jobs. So there had to be a lot of adaptation of the response to the culture, to the sheer scale of this thing, to their urban environment. So a lot of adaptation to the way we would normally apply some of the Ebola strategies and tactics. The third piece that has been absolutely critical to this has been the constant innovation. Not only adapting strategies, but also innovating. Today, we are using different diagnostics. We're using different tools. We even have vaccines. We're using different operational approaches and forward operating sites, different ways to track our contacts and the missing contacts, different resources to address those problems. So three big things have made the difference. Extraordinary leadership, um, rapid adaptation, and constant innovation. That's the key to operating at this scale with such a, often for many, uh, terrifying pathogen. And finally, we're close to the end, but the job isn't done yet. 
what now needs to be done? Three big things are critical at this point in the response. So we're very, very close to zero. We aren't at zero. So the first thing is completing uh, the elimination of Ebola from the human population there and ensuring we hit zero. Making sure people don't pack up and go home before it's over. Too many people have packed up already from some areas that simply don't have the resources to do it on their own. The second thing that we've got to do is to remember the survivors and take care of their needs. As we get to zero, there's a huge risk that as we forget about Ebola in these countries, people also forget about the survivors. And the survivors, and there's thousands of survivors, they are dealing with ongoing challenges to their medical health, they're dealing with uh, persistence of the virus, and these are challenges to them, to their own health, and to that of their families. I was Ebola free, however, many people still treat me as if I still I have Ebola. My final message to people. We've got to help the survivors, we've got to help them manage those challenges so that they don't become bigger problems and cause new problems as we go forward through 2016 and as the virus that is persisting in some people in this, uh, in this uh, population dies out completely. So that's the second big challenge. And the third big challenge is going to be to take the lessons that we have learned from the Ebola response and make sure that we can respond faster, more effectively, more predictably, more dependently, more efficiently when the next time we face a pathogen like that. And that's going to mean taking a really hard look. What have we learned about leadership and coordination right at the top of this? What have we learned about information? Information management is absolutely fundamental in running a response. What have we learned about operations management for a large-scale response? And then most importantly, what gets forgotten all the time is what have we learned about those core functions? How do you get the people, the money, the equipment, what we think about as the administration and management stuff, the business of large-scale health emergency management. So what have we learned in those four areas? How do we lock in those lessons? How do we change what we do within WHO, within the international system, and in countries at the national level to make sure when we face a pathogen like Ebola the next time it doesn't get the foot up on us that it did this time?